Hello, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, marginalization and the othering of patients within the healthcare system. <clears throat> so one population that I think is marginalized within the healthcare system is the obese population. Um, I feel like when hearing nurses talk and providers talk about patients um, outside of patient earshot, um, when the patients are obese, that oftentimes they attribute a lot of it the problems to the obesity, which is understandable and justifiable given the risks that have been proven to be associated with obesity. Um, however, at the same time, I feel like there's this stigma um, where it's automatically assumed that the obese patient is lazy um, and that they are not doing whatever's in their power to um, lose that weight and reduce those risks. <clears throat> um, and it's something that I've kind of seen working at the hospital, and I did just a quick uh, Google Scholar search and reviewed some articles to see if there was anything that substantiated that belief. I found that Cole and Hewer 2010 found that obese patients are frequently and consistently stigmatized and discriminated against. Um, that same article went on to explain that uh, provi some providers actually believe that the stigmatization um, is appropriate and that it will motivate the obese patient to uh, hopefully lose weight um, and reduce their risks. Um, <clears throat> but the fact that it's occurring to begin with, I think is a major red flag and contributes to this marginalization of the obese population. Um, in, when I was going through the cross L 2013 article, it defined biases as uh, predictable variations from rationality. Um, however, I think the most important uh, part of that definition that was in the article was the fact that biases can be recognized and they can be corrected, which means that <clears throat> if we do our due diligence and take this seriously, not only can we identify these biases, but hopefully we can put steps in place to correct it. The Karoski <clears throat> et al. 2013 article goes on to, ex uh, to expand about two different types or methodologies of clinical decision-making. In type one, <clears throat> it consists of unconscious and unexamined decision-making in the intuitive mode. So this is when a provider uses uh, knowledge that's readily available to them um, and is able to recall easily to make clinical decisions. And while that type of decision-making is important in emergency situation when things need to be done rapidly, um, it's also more prone to error. The other type of uh, or mode of clinical decision-making that can be used is a type two, which is a slower, deliberate, and rule-based model um, that systematically goes through and reviews literature, reviews evidence-based practices, reviews guidelines, et cetera, to make a clinical decision. While it's more time consuming, um, it may prevent error. Um, there are still situations where, you know, bias and marginalization can occur even while using a type two uh, mode of clinical decision-making. However, <clears throat> by going through and having that slow and deliberate systematic approach, it helps to prevent uh, bias. So um, in kind of, you know, considering this, um, one major way that providers can potentially reduce the bias, marginalization, and othering of obese patients is to uh, change their view from a type one uh, mode of thinking to a type two mode of thinking. So rather than just initially um, assuming that the reason all these problems are happening is because of obesity and assuming that it's because of laziness or failure to work out or diet is taking that type two mode and slowing down, trying to figure out what's going on what's the background behind it, what's recommended, and then move from there. Um, I think having that systematic approach is important because it reasons why each step is being taken. <clears throat> I think another major, uh, another major step that can be incorporated into that shifting the mode from type one to type two thinking is to implement interdisciplinary, more interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary uh, collaboration. So while we, it's, it's clear, it's evident that obesity causes a lot of these issues or at least contributes to them, we shift our thinking to type two and incorporate not only a physician and a nurse and nurse practitioner, but also a nutritionist, a dietitian, a psychologist. I think the group together can come together and say, okay, what is, what is the reason behind this? And, and how can we fix this systematically and how can we ensure that whatever interventions that we do put into effect are in the um, the best care of the patient and are being done ethically and responsibly as well. Um, 
and kind of thinking about, you know, how does this, does this group, the obese population receive equal care to those who are not in the group? Um, I think on the surface they do, but I think down beneath they don't. I think when, um, you know, the Pull and Hewer et al, or excuse me, the Pull and Hewer 2010 article found that a lot, um, some of the physicians that were interviewed believe that the stigmatization is good because it helps them. Um, it, it would motivate them to lose weight, at least that's a belief. Um, I think that's a red flag because we don't do that for other issues. You know, when um, age, for example, <clears throat> leads to higher risk of certain diseases and conditions. Um, and there may be some bias and stigmatization with age. However, we don't see outward and blatant, at least I haven't seen as often as we do with obesity, stigmatization and um, othering. And so I think that they are treated differently. And I think that that type of care from the provider to the patient can have an impact on the patient and whether they believe that they can change or whether it motivates their behavior change. Um, Lastly, um, in reviewing the BA et al. 2018 article, it states that marginalization occurs when one of three things happen, right? So it, it occurs when there's creation of margins, when, which is uh, factors that push some people to the periphery of society, living when individuals live between cultures and when there are creation of vulnerabilities. I think the obese population falls within the creation of margins and creation of vulnerabilities. Obviously, they're vulnerable because their weight puts them at an increased risk of certain um, diseases and conditions and providers know that and stigmatize them as was stated in the Pullen Hewer 2010 article. And I also think that there's creations of margins because, because when patients come in and they are obese and there is this bias that it is often due to being lazy, not eating, dieting incorrectly, um, it, it others them and it, it does push them to the, to the periphery because they are seen as different from all the other people who come in with a normal BMI. So uh, just in conclusion, like I said, I, I think in order to change this, uh, a major first step would be to shift the mode of thinking from a type one clinical decision making to a type two clinical decision making and incorporating multidisciplinary teams to not only um, serve these obese patients with compassion and respect, but also to do so in a way that actually gets to the core of their issue. You know, if the obesity is what's causing all these issues that got them hospitalized or brings them to the doctor, um, we need to be able to address those issues, which can be multifaceted. Um, it, could, it could potentially be because of diet and exercise um, and genetics, but it can also be you know, psychological. It can also be hormonal, like if someone has hypothyroidism. So I think the combination of type one and type two thinking with a multidisciplinary team can help uh, to ensure that um, obese patients get uh, equal, equitable, and a high level of quality of healthcare. So thank you. And if you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the comment section.